Once, long ago, there was a man and woman, a husband and wife, and they were very, very happy. They had one son. For although they had longed for children, and although they had wished for children, and although they had prayed for children, they had no children. And one day in winter, the wife was standing under a juniper tree in a courtyard that was in front of her house. And she was peeling an apple when the knife slipped and it cut her finger. And three drops of blood fell into the snow. And as she looked at those three drops of blood, she said, Ah! Oh, only I had a child as red as blood and as white as snow. Why would you say that? I have no idea. But that's what she said. And as she said that, she had a happy feeling as though it would come to pass. And that was the first month. And in the second month, the snow still lay on the ground. And in the third month, the snow melted. And in the fourth month, the flowers bloomed. And in the fifth month, the birds began to sing. And in the sixth month, the tree grew new leaves and the branches intertwined with each other. And in the seventh month, the berries on that juniper tree grew ripe. And the woman stood beneath that juniper tree and ate handful after handful after handful of those juniper berries. And in the eighth month, the woman began to feel most unwell. And she said to her husband, If I should die, bury me beneath the juniper tree. And he agreed. And in the ninth month, the woman brought forth a child, a son. And he was beautiful. He was as red as blood and as white as snow. Although which parts of him were which it never says. But as she looked down at her child, oh, she was so happy. She was so happy, she was so happy that she died. <laughs> Can't be too happy at these stars. And so her husband buried her beneath the juniper tree. And he was distraught, he was overcome with sadness that he wept and wept and wept and was completely inconsolable. And after a time, though he still wept, he was consolable. <laughs> and after a time, he married again. And the woman he married, well, she and that man, they had a child of their own. A little girl, a beautiful little girl, whom they named Marlena. Now, you might be wondering what the name of that boy was, you know. That was blood about his son. What was his name? I have no idea. The story does not say. It only calls him the boy. Well, the stepmother, she loved her daughter, but she could not abide her stepson. She thought of him as an impediment between her daughter and her daughter's inheritance, and so she treated the boy harshly. She spoke to him unkindly, and she pinched him and boxed his ears and slapped him from one side of the house to the other until he had no peace at all from the time he came home from school till the time he went back in the morning. One day, Marlena came to her mother and said, Mother, may I have an apple? And her mother said, Of course, child, you may have an apple. Come with me. And she led her into her bedroom where the apples were kept. No fruit bowl on the kitchen counter. <laughs> and the apples were in a big oaken trunk with a heavy oaken lid with a heavy iron lock. You have to wonder about the price of apples in those days. The mother unlocked the chest and raised the lid and said, Take an apple, any apple you like. Choose a good one. And Marlena reached into the trunk and pulled out an apple. And then looking at her stepmother, she said, And shall brother have an apple too? Oh, that made her stepmother furious. And she took that apple from Marlena and she threw it back in the trunk. And she slammed down that heavy oaken lid with a heavy, sharp iron. Walk, and she said, yes, brother shall have an apple too. You shall both have an apple when your brother comes home from school. And sure enough, shortly after that, the boy did come home from school. And he was met at the door by his stepmother who said, boy, would you like an apple? And he thought to himself, ooh, how fierce she looks. But he also thought to himself, she's never asked me. Anything nice 
like a piece of fresh fruit before. I better take her up on it. And I said, yes, yes, mother, I would like an apple. And she said, good, come with me. And she led him into the bedroom where she unlocked that heavy iron lock on that large chest. And she raised up that heavy oaken lid and she said, take any apple you like. She was a good one. And he leaned into the chest to choose an apple. And as he did, she slammed down that heavy oaken lid with a heavy sharp iron lock right on the boy's unprotected neck and it chopped off his head. The one rolling in into the chest of the apples. And then she said, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Not that she felt sad about what she had done, but she was thinking about how to disguise what she had done. And so she took the boy's body and his head, which she had to retreat from the chest of the apples, and she set them on a chair by the door. The head. She wrapped a scarf around the neck so that nothing showed her this, and she put an apple into the boy's hand. And then she went into the kitchen and she got out a big iron pot and she filled it with water and set it on the fire. A little while later, Marlena came running into the kitchen and she said, Mother, Mother, something is terribly wrong. Brother is sitting on a chair by the door, and oh, Mother, he looks so pale that he has an apple in his hand, and I asked him if he would share with me, but he didn't say anything at all. And the mother said, he said nothing? Oh, what a wicked boy. You must ask him again, and if he does not share with you, then box his ears. Yes, mother said Marlena, and she went back to her brother, and she asked him to share the apple, and he said nothing, of course, because he was dead. And so she didn't want to box him on the ears as she'd seen her mother do, but she did give him a little shove, and that was enough. The body fell to the ground, and the head fell off and rolled across the floor, and Marlena went running back to her mother. She said, Mother, Mother, it's terrible. I have killed my brother. He is dead. His head is rolling across the floor. And her mother said, Oh, dear. Oh, there is nothing to be done for it now. We shall have to, here the logic of fairy tales kicks in, we shall have to, we shall have to make him into stew. <laughs> so she chopped up the body and she put it into the cauldron of water along with some potatoes and carrots and turnips and spices and then she had poor Marlena stir it and as Marlena stirred it she wept and wept and wept so that the stew needed no additional salt. <laughs> After a while, the father came home. He said, oh, something smells wonderful. What is for dinner? And the stepmother said, oh, I have made a special stew for you. And it is just now ready. Sit down and I will get you some. And she ladled out a big bowl of it and set it in front of him. And he said, are you not eating? And she said, oh, I will eat later. He said, but Marlena said, oh, Marlena is very sad. She has no appetite. He said, but where is my son? And the stepmother said, oh, he has gone to visit his uncle. Really, he did not say goodbye to me. No, he told me to tell you goodbye. He said to tell you that he will be gone for six weeks. But Marlena, as you can see, is very sad. And the father said, oh, Marlena, don't be sad. Your brother will soon be home and all will be well. This is what we call irony. <laughs> So the father took a bite of the stew and he said, Oh, the stew is wonderful. It is so good. I am glad that none of you wants any of it because, well, it seems that it should be all mine. All mine and no one else shall have a drop of it. And so he ate bowl after bowl after bowl of it until the stew was completely gone. And as was the custom in those days, you gnawed the meat from the bones and then sucked the bones dry and then threw them under the table. But when dinner was over, such as it was, and the table was cleared, well, then Marlena went to her bottom drawer and she got a, a white silk kerchief and she crept back into the dining room under the table and she gathered up the bones of her brother in that silk kerchief and she went out and put them beneath the juniper tree. And then the most amazing thing happened. At the base of the juniper tree, there was a, a thick white mist. And in the mist, in the midst of the mist, there was a fire. And out of the fire there flew a bird, beautiful bird, with red and green feathers and a neck that looked like pure gold, and eyes that shone like stars. And seeing that bird made Marlena happy. The bird flew away. The bird flew 
to the village where it landed on the roof of a goldsmith's shop. The goldsmith was just fashioning a golden chain when the bird landed on the roof, and the bird began to sing. My mother, she killed me, my father, he ate me, my sister, my they did together my bones, and then she did lay them beneath the fine juniper, to it to why, what a fine bird am I? <laughs> well, the goldsmith, he ran out of the house, and or the shop, and he said, wow, what a beautiful song, sing that song again. And the bird said, nay, I'll not sing it twice for nothing. And the goldsmith said, well, then you shall have this chain. And he tossed the chain up into the air, and the bird caught it in his right claw and sang again. My mother, she killed me, my father, he ate me, the la, 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 la. And when it was done, that bird, it flew to another shop. It was a cobbler shop, a shoemaker's. And the shoemaker was making some shoes. That's what they do. Some very nice red shoes. And as he was making them, the bird began to sing. My mother, she, you can join in if you want. <laughs> my mother, she killed me, my father, she killed me, my sister, my lady, and together my bones. And then she did lay them beneath the dodge of the bird. To it, to one, what a fine bird am I. Yeah, I'm catching up. <laughs> well, when the shoemaker heard that, he ran out of the shop and he said, Bird! That's some really nice song. Sing it again. And the bird said, Nay, I'll not sing it twice for nothing. And the cobbler said, Well, then you shall have these red shoes. And he tossed them into the air, and the bird caught them in his left claw and sang again. You guys did such a good job with that. We'll let you do it again. My mother, she killed me. My father, he ate me. My sister, my lady, did gather my bones. And then she did lay them beneath the fine juniper. To it, to one, what a fine bird am I. You guys are good. I'm going to have to take you wherever I go to tell them this song. Well, so then the bird flew off. It flew to a mill where there were 20 millers, 20 apprentice millers, who were working on making a new millstone. And they had chisels and they had hammers and they were chopping away at the rock when the bird began to sing. My mother, she killed me, my father, he ate me, my sister, my mother, he did gather my bones, and then she did lay them beneath the tall juniper, to it, to one, what a fine bird am I. <laughs> well, when it sang the first line, one of the millers stopped working to listen. At the next line, two more millers stopped, and the next four more millers stopped, and one by one the millers stopped until it got to the last line, and the last miller stopped to listen. But of course, they only caught the last line, and so the, the 20th miller said, Bird, sing again. And the bird said, Nay, I'll not sing twice for nothing. And the miller said, Well, I would give you this millstone if it were just mine to give. And the other 19 millers, they said, Yes! Let's give the millstone to the bird. And so they hoisted it upright, and the bird flew down and caught that millstone around its neck and carried it off as though it were no heavier than a collar. And then the bird flew back to the juniper tree and sat on the juniper tree and began to sing. My mother, she hear me, my father, he ate me, my sister, my lady, to get up my bones. And then she did lay them beneath the tall juniper, to it to fly, what a fine bird am I. Well, at the first one, the father stopped to listen. He said, there's a bird singing out there. I must go here. And so he went outside, and as he listened to the bird, the bird dropped down the golden chain. And it fell right around the miller's neck, beautiful golden chain. And, no, he wasn't the miller, was he? Anyway, the father, he went back in, and he said to his wife and his daughter, the bird is a wonderful bird, and it has gold, and a golden neck, it shines like pure gold, it has red and green feathers, it has eyes that sparkle like stars. And look, it gave me this really nice gold chain. It makes me feel so happy. You should go out and see, and see the bird, and listen to its song. The bird kept singing, and the stepmother said, It does not make me feel happy. It does not make me feel happy at all. It makes me feel like my blood is going to boil. It makes me feel like my head is going to split in two. It makes me feel like the world is coming to an end. I shall not go out. But Marlena said, I'll go out, Father. And so she opened the door and went outside, and the bird was still singing, and the bird dropped 
down a pair of red shoes. And Marlena put them on and danced back into the house. And she said, Mother, Mother, the bird is indeed beautiful and its song is wonderful and it makes me feel so happy. Look, it has given me these nice red shoes. And the mother said, It does not make me feel happy. It makes me feel as though the earth should open up and I should fall into the center of it. It makes me feel terrible. But on the other hand, perhaps if I went outside, that would help. And maybe the bird has a gift for me too. And so she opened the door and stood outside. And the bird dropped that millstone right on her head and crushed her to death. And then, beneath the juniper, there was a mist, a thick white mist, and in the midst of the mist, a fire. And out of the fire there stepped a boy, the boy. You know, the one that was as red as blood and as white as snow, as alive as ever he had been. And he embraced his father, and he embraced his sister, and the three of them took each other by the hand and went back into the house. And from all accounts, the three of them lived happily ever after. And that's the story from the Brothers Grimm of the Jennifer Tree.